All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, this is the Texas Dialogue on the Next Decade of Climate Action. I hope you're all staying safe and staying away from each other in this crazy time. So a little bit of background of this event is there are 50 or so other simultaneous webinars going on right now across all 50 states around the country. And this is Texas's one. So we have some wonderful speakers for you today. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who's in the red shirt. Um, Mr. Ben Hirsch, who's in the yellow, and he'll be having another person join us. And then Dr. Jim Crane from the Baker Institute will be joining us as well. So the format of how this is gonna go is we're gonna have, I'm gonna have a quick intro video first, and then after that, we'll have the three panelists speak, and then after that, we're gonna have about 15 minutes for questions, which you can type in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this intro video. Welcome to Solve Climate by 2030. Today, universities in almost all 50 U.S. states, Puerto Rico, D.C., and several other countries are hosting state and region-wide webinars focused on ambitious and feasible things that we can all do in our cities, our towns, and states in the coming year to really move the needle on climate change. Here is the most important idea to take home today. What you do locally will change the future. Fact. The U.S. state of Georgia is a top 10 solar state. The neighboring Sunshine State of Florida has very little solar power due to outdated laws and regulations. When we launched Solve Climate a year ago, we could never have imagined that today, entire countries and much of the world's economy would be shut down, with hundreds of thousands of people ill, thousands having passed away, and our health systems overwhelmed. I take that back. We could easily have imagined this. Our health experts and scientists warned us this was coming. After SARS and MERS, they told us this was coming, and yet we didn't take preventive action, we didn't prepare. COVID-19 has shown how fragile our health and economic systems are to extreme events. Our scientists have told us clearly that unchecked, climate change will turn our lives into an unending series of extreme events. Floods, droughts, rising sea levels, pests and disease, more extreme storms and hurricanes, all of this leaving hundreds of millions of people homeless and on the move. We can change this. We still have time to change that future. Last year, the world's top climate scientists told us that we have until 2030, 10 years now, to cut global warming pollution aggressively in order to stabilize the climate at the low end. That warning was the genesis for this national and international discussion today on how to solve climate by 2030. Solving climate in 10 years, that sounds challenging. And yet fixing the energy half of climate change by 2030 is looking more, not less likely than it was four years ago. The cost of solar and wind power, batteries, and electric vehicles have plummeted. In many cases, they are less expensive now than the fossil fuel power that causes global warming and they are getting cheaper every day. Already, utility scale wind and solar, big solar and wind farms that feed power into the grid, these technologies are crushing fossil fuels in much of the US. In Colorado, Idaho, and California, renewable bids are coming in at half the price that the cheapest fossil fuel plants can do. And this is where rooftop solar and battery systems are headed in the near future. On the vehicles front, all the major manufacturers see this coming. Mercedes-Benz announced last fall that they have designed their last gasoline-powered car. Going forward, every new model of theirs will be electric. Combining electric-powered vehicles with the impact of driverless technology, we could see a very rapid transition away from gasoline-based cars to EVs in the next decade. All this progress was the result of a major technology push by national governments. Starting in America in the 70s and then ramping up with the Danes, the British, the Japanese and Koreans, the Germans, and most recently, the Chinese and Indians, government policies have brought these industries to scale. And now the market is taking over, and renewables, battery storage, and electric vehicles are on track to deliver power and transportation at prices unsubsidized that will lead to major disruptions of energy markets in the 2020s. Can we get there fast enough to solve climate? Well, this is where you come in. 
With plummeting prices for renewables and electric powered transports, the pace of the clean energy revolution will no longer be determined by Washington, D.C. and other national governments. Instead, the core action is going to be in your city, at your electric utility, and in your state capital. The key to solving climate by 2030 will be clearing the path at the local level to rapid deployment of solar, wind, battery storage, and electric vehicles. We need to get rid of outmoded laws and regulations that are holding back the transition. Florida needs to take the lesson from Georgia. It's imperative that we have justice in this transition. We have to make sure that the millions of green jobs that are created are jobs for all, and that everyone has access to clean, affordable power and mobility. Today, in Nebraska and New Jersey, in Idaho and Alabama, in Bangladesh and Brazil, we're gonna find out what are three ambitious but feasible things that we can do right at home to smooth the path for clean energy and to bring energy justice to our communities. Following the webinar, I hope you will join a group or class discussion about what you can do to make these solutions real. Then, what next? Well, this summer, young people in particular have a terrific opportunity to both support climate solutions and gain valuable job skills in a down economy. The most powerful thing you can do to solve climate by 2030 is to join the political campaign of a candidate who best represents your views on climate solutions. In doing that, you'll also learn how to communicate, you'll gain courage, and most importantly, be part of a creative, strong, powerful vision for the future. COVID-19 is giving us a stark lesson about what happens when we ignore warnings from science. Today, we'll see how 10 years can be enough time to drive the climate solutions that we need and that the future will be what we make it. Thank you for the work you will do to solve climate. Let's get started with Dr. Hayhoe speaking, if you're ready. Sure. Um, welcome, everybody. It is fantastic to see so many people here. Hopefully, you can hear me okay now. We are live. I am an atmospheric scientist and a professor at Texas Tech University. So we are really covering the whole state with this webinar. And I want to kick it off by talking to you about why, when it comes to climate change, Texas is ground zero. People often ask me, you know, why, why are you in Texas? Isn't it difficult to be a climate scientist in Texas? And while sometimes it certainly is, there are tremendous opportunities to being in this state as well. And I want to share some of those with you now. So let me share my screen with you. Here we go. And I'm going to start this up. All right. When it comes to climate change, here are four reasons why Texas is ground zero. Number one is probably the one that you already thought of. We produce more carbon than any other state. Now the flip side of that, if you're a glass half full person, is that means we have the greatest potential to reduce our emissions too. When you look at every state, I know California here is the same color as Texas, but when you look at the actual numbers, we are definitely ahead of California. It's not only our carbon emissions though, it's the fact that we also produce as much or more oil and gas than any other state as well. So we have the furthest to go. The second reason why Texas is ground zero is this, and this is what I study in my own work. We, our state, is more vulnerable to climate and weather disasters than any other state in the country. You may say, are you sure about that? I am, and here's why. First of all, wherever we live, we know that we are at risk from normal weather, right? We know that there are ups and downs, there is hot and cold, there is wet and dry, and if we live in Texas, we know it looks more like this. We had, for example, in August 2018, if you can think back a year and a half ago, almost 80% of the state was in drought, just as an example. And then by the fall, Central Texas was experiencing its wettest fall on record. Conditions here change so fast, they give you whiplash. We get floods, we get drought, we get wildfire, and in fact, here it is, it really is official. When you look at the map of the number of 
weather and climate disasters that have caused at least a billion dollars worth of damage since 1980, Texas is number one. We have had more of them than any other state because of our geographic location. We get pretty much everything. We get storms and floods and hurricanes and ice storms and hail and tornadoes. We get pretty much it all. And why do we care about that? We care about it because the number one way climate change is affecting us is by loading the natural weather dice against us. What do I mean by that? Well, we know that we always have a chance of just rolling a double six by chance. That's a hurricane, a flood, a heat wave, a big storm. We also know that if we live in Texas, we already have three sixes on our dice naturally. So how does climate change come in? Decade by decade, as the world warms, it's like it's sneaking in and taking one of those numbers and turning it into a six and then another six and then maybe even a seven. And before we know it, if we're living in Houston, we're like, hey, we just had three 500 year flood events in three years, what's going on? Climate change is loading the dice against us. Specifically here in Texas, it is making our heavy rainfall events stronger and more frequent. It is making our heat waves in the summer stronger and more frequent as well. Ironically, it's also when our droughts come, as they always do naturally, our droughts are stronger because the hotter it is, the more water evaporates from our soils and our reservoirs. And then there's hurricanes. Now, hurricanes are not getting more frequent. They aren't but there's a lot more rainfall associated with them today in a warmer world because warmer air holds more water vapor. So when a storm comes along today, and hurricanes are very big storms, there's a lot more water vapor for them to sweep up and dump on us today than there was 50 or 100 years ago. And in fact, with Hurricane Harvey, it is estimated that 40% of the rain that fell during Hurricane Harvey would not have happened if the same hurricane had occurred 100 or more years ago, like the Galveston hurricane from 1900, for example. We also know that hurricanes are powered by warm ocean water, and the oceans are warming. They are causing storms to intensify a lot faster. They ratchet up from a tropical cyclone to a category one, two, three, four, or five a lot faster. More of them get to a higher category these days, so there's more of them that are stronger. They're moving more slowly so they can dump more rain on us. They are also getting bigger so they cover more area, and of course, sea level is rising also. After the hurricane decimated the island of Dominica in the Caribbean, the Prime Minister of Dominica said this. He said, to deny climate change is to deny a truth we have just lived. But we could equally say this right here in Texas. So what's the third reason? The third reason why Texas is ground zero when it comes to climate change is the fact that many of us don't agree with the science, although many do. A new poll that was just released a few months ago by the University of Texas found that although most of us agree that climate is changing, over 70% of us would say, yes, it is getting warmer why we think that's happening and what we think we should do about it is split along partisan lines. Let me just give you two examples. Example number one, do you think climate is changing? 66% of us would say yes, but when you split it out, it turns out that Republicans are at 44% and Democrats are at 88%. Then if you ask people, just a second here, how much should the government be doing about it? 47% of us think they should be doing a lot, but if you break that out by political affiliation, Democrats are 79%, Independents 41, and Republicans 18. So it is ground zero when it comes to the political polarization of climate change, as well as the impacts of climate change, as well as producing carbon emissions and oil and gas. So what's number four? Number four is the good news. And here it is. We here in Texas have the solutions at our fingertips. We know that we're already famous for wind. We know that our state has more wind energy, according to the American Wind Energy Association, 
We have more wind energy than any other state in the country. If you click on Texas here on this map, here's what pops up. The number of wind projects that we had, the amount of wind that we were generating, the wind energy potential, the fact that we're powering 7 million homes, and the fact that there are uh, over 30,000 jobs in clean energy. When you look at the installed wind capacity across the country, you can see huge concentrations in Texas and in Iowa. But we don't often think about other ways to get or save energy like efficiency. Did you know that when they estimate which state could save the most by simply becoming more efficient and less wasteful in the way we use our electricity, Texas is number one. We have the potential to save more energy than any other state, as well as having more wind energy. And we were not even on the map for solar energy 10 years ago. But today, Texas is already climbing the charts. We are already in the top 10 states for solar. And a headline from just a couple of weeks ago, or sorry, back in December said, solar is expected to disrupt the Texas fossil fuel apple cart. Specifically, Texas is expected to double its solar output next year and the year after that. So we could soon be number two or three easily in solar as well. Now, when it comes to solar, people often say, yeah, but we don't have the area for solar. We don't have enough space to put all that solar up. Anybody who says that has not been to West Texas. Because if you go to West Texas, I have calculated how much area it would take to cover with conventional solar panels, not new school, just what we have today, how much area it would take covered with solar panels to supply not only Texas's electricity, but the entire country's electricity. Here's what that looks like. Oops, sorry, there we go. Here's what it looks like. It looks like a square that's about 100 by 120 miles square. I would like to point out that Elon Musk and I both calculated this independently and we came up with similar numbers. In fact, there was a really interesting figure that was produced a little while ago showing what area of land we use for what purpose around the US. And for solar energy, if we're gonna supply the whole country with solar energy, and of course we don't have to do that because we also have wind, we have efficiency, we have more. If we were only gonna use solar energy, it would be the same area as is currently used for golf or maple syrup. That's how much area it would be. So I calculated this and I put it on Twitter and I said, people worry about how much land we need to supply the US with clean energy. Well, Elon Musk and I have independently calculated it and we both come up with something roughly comparable to the area we currently use for maple syrup or golf. And here's the proof. He replied and he said, good analysis, although a little conservative in my opinion. He probably has new technology that I am not aware of. However, using a high upper bound, that is a tiny percentage of the US area. That giant fusion reactor in the sky called the sun outputs a truly staggering amount of energy. So that's why number four is the best part because the solutions are right here in our hands. We have the first carbon neutral airport in North America, DFW. We have the biggest army base in the US and it has been powered exclusively by wind and solar energy for two years, saving taxpayers millions of dollars. We have entire cities going green. We have more wind power than anywhere else in the entire country. And we are competing at the national and international stage with countries like Morocco that have the biggest solar farm in the world, countries like the UK that have the biggest offshore wind farm in the world, and China, which has more wind and solar energy than any other country in the world. As John Holdren, President Obama's former science advisor said, he said this, he said, looking to the future, we have three choices. We can reduce our emissions, that's mitigation, we can prepare for a very different future, which we're gonna to have to do anyways because we can't avoid all the impacts, or we're going to suffer. And we're gonna do some of each. The only question is what the mix will be because the faster we cut our emissions, the less adaptations required, the less suffering there will be. And Texas has a huge role to play in making sure that happens. Thank you. Hey, thank you. So
Dr. Hayho. Um, I'm gonna here. I I meant to give her a nice introduction before she talked. So I just wanted to point out that uh, this is the thing I've written down. Dr. Hayho is an accomplished atmospheric scientist. So this climate change and why it matters to us here and how. She is also a remarkable communicator who has been named to a number of lists, including Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Thinkers, and Fortune Magazine's World's 50 Greatest Leaders. So I just wanted everyone to know how incredible it was that she was talking to us today. So thank you, Dr. Hayo. Well, time for questions for her later. Next, we have Mr. Ben Hirsch and Ms. Doris. Ben is a community organizer and policy advocate for the Grassroots Disaster Recovery Organization, West Street Recovery, based in Houston, Texas. He is a graduate of the University of Texas LBJ School of Public Affairs, and his interests are poverty and the environmental and alternative structures of government. So Ben is going to talk to us with him, and it's going to be some sort of dialogue. So take it away. Yeah, James, do you mind uh, unmuting Doris? Or are we in the same yes. cycle? Okay, awesome. Doris, can we hear you? I don't know, can you? Yes, excellent. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, Doris and I are both wearing these uh, Northeast Action Collective shirts. Um, and the Northeast Action Collective is a small group of people just like Doris who um, has been an uh, absolute inspiration to work with for the last, how long have we known each other? Maybe two years at this point, yes, about two, two years. years. Um, and I'll just tell you that uh, I'm going to let Doris talk a little bit about her neighborhood and the impact of climate change on her neighborhood. And then I'm going to try to put it in a little bit of context of what uh, Catherine Hayo said. Um, but we both are members of the Northeast Action Collective, and we're both part of West Street Recovery, which are organizations, both of them are in Houston. So we hope to hear from you guys in the future. But Doris, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what your neighborhood is like and what the impact of climate change is going to be on your neighborhood and what are the, some things you're worried about? Well, I'm worried about, we, we stay over here in the industrial area. And for years, the uh, the emissions from those um, oil and gas, whenever they have an explosion or anything like that, it seems to waft over this way. And we just, for years we have protested this and we having all these explosions and everything. And our neighborhood floods. I don't care, heavy rain, it floods and has always did it. The drains, they don't even, bother to clean our drains. I, it's, I guess it's our socioeconomic poverty over here. I guess that's what we are. We never see a politician or anything until it's time to vote. They promise, come in here and promise us all this, that they're going to do this, try to alleviate and mitigate flooding, and it never happens. The only time we ever get any help is when we get out and do it ourselves. And that's why we had to band together and make come up with the Northeast Action collective. It's a bunch of us neighbors, communities that came together in order to fight this. We, we're we tired of just being left out. We want to know when are we going to have ep a more equitable use to, for years. It's just going on the same thing over and over again. And we're tired of flooding. We're tired of inhaling all this pollution. You can't even see a star in the sky because we live in a haze over us. And it's the children are coming with, with asthma, the born with asthma and stuff. And it, it's just all kinds of respiratory diseases we're suffering with over here. And it's just, no one seems to be doing anything. No one seems to be counting us in as potential, <coughs> giving us any kind of help is what I'm trying to say. So. Yeah, so um, I think what Doris is laying out really, really clearly is that if you live in a neighborhood like Northeast Houston, which is a, it was originally a Jim Crow segregated neighborhood where only African American folks could live. Now it is segregation is maintained through other means um, in terms of it's a more polluted area, it's more flood prone. So if you have a lot of choice in where you're going to live, you're not going to choose to live in a dangerous and polluted area. So it ends up with concentrations of people who have the least 
power. They have the least power in our society. And what I think is important to know when we talk about climate change is that climate change, it's not just that people that are the most impacted by climate change will be marginalized people, will be poor people, people of color. It's also that climate change itself reinforces that, that marginalization. So for example, Doris has built up wealth in her house over her, her lifetime. But when she gets flooded, all the wealth that she has been built up, it, it's all destroyed through no, ho no, no wrongdoing of her own. And at the same time, the great wealth and prosperity that were generated through burning fossil fuels, people like Doris and in Doris's neighborhood have received the least benefits from that. That's not to say that they haven't had some benefit living in an industrialized society in, in the developed world, right? But Katie or, or Memorial look very different from Mesa and Tidwell or Mesa and Homewood, where, which is where Doris lives. So I just want to really quickly show you guys, um, oh, this is confusing. How do I do this? I'm going to show you some pictures of what the of what Northeast Next Door looks like because I think it's really important for people to know what does it look like when you do organizing, and what it looks like is this. I am going to try to show my screen here. I'm not sure it's totally working. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, okay. Doors, can you see it? Because you're the only one I can hear right now. So this is yeah. us. This is us meeting in a in a house. This is what building power looks like, and this is what we're going to need to do a lot of. We're going to need to adopt the strategies that Dr. Hayho has suggested on a large scale. But we're also going to need to build local power to make sure that the transition to renewable energy is a just transition. And this is pictures of us doing what Doris said, which is creating that change for ourselves. One thing that we noticed was the drains are not maintained in Doris's neighborhood. So a, a little bit of rain, which would be dealt with easily by a, a modern drainage system in a black and brown neighborhood, it sits in people's yards. That degrades their foundations, it degrades their house over time. And this is a picture of us literally cleaning out the drains ourselves. Um, we had about 100 people that came out uh, last May and we, we conducted this this project to clean out the drains and i just want to sh show these pictures because this is what it looks like when communities show up for themselves and when they get support to to show up for themselves and i think that it's really important to know that that's what's going to need to happen or else we're going to do the the really good work that uh dr hayho has suggested but the benefits are going to be distributed unevenly just as they always have historically. Always. So that's basically our thing. And what the last thing I would like to say is that the current frameworks for making change in our society don't necessarily have the capacity to deliver the kind of change that we need. So when we do environmental justice organizing, it's really about trying to shift culture and shift the way people talk about these problems and the way they understand the problems. And it's also about taking care of each other because we know that we're suggesting a massive transition which will be very disruptive, which is to end the use of fossil fuels and that we're gonna have to figure out ways to take care of each other in our communities that can sustain us as we do this really difficult work. So that's basically our spiel of who we are. And I think it's important to know that people like Doris have been excluded from the biggest conversations about our strategy as a society of what we're gonna do. And if they continue to be excluded, they will be again left out in, in being considered when we make the solutions. So I think it's on everyone to try to make sure that we're actively working to include people like that and, and to learn from that wisdom. I don't know if Dor Doris, if you have one last quick thing to say, it seems like uh, Dr. Jim Crane got here, so. <laughs> Yeah, I just want a more effort for Houston. I, I just want some help for our neighborhood. I need to know what part will we play in the big picture? When will someone come ask us or try to help us help ourselves? That's it for me.
it's a great point for us to end on, I think. Thank you so much, Mr. Hirsch and Ms. Doris for speaking for us today. Um, our last speaker today is Dr. Jim Crane, who's just joined us. Dr. Crane is the Wallace S. Wilson Fellow for Energy Studies at Rice University's Baker Institute. He's recently named the leading energy think tank in the world. His research addresses the geopolitics aspects of energy with a focus on the Middle East and OPEC states and their political and economic strategies. His scholarly articles focus on energy subsidies and demand, as well as internal politics and exploring states. He teaches classes on energy policy and geopolitics at Rice University. So Dr. Crane, take it away. Well, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, coming through okay? Okay, hey, I'm sorry I'm late. I, I must have gotten the time wrong here. Um, but um, regardless, I'll, uh, I'll just charge ahead here. Um, so I look, as, uh, as James said, um, I look at climate change from the perspective of oil exporting countries. Uh, so I look at, uh, you know, how it might affect a, uh, you know, a country that's really dependent on oil, uh, especially countries in the Middle East, big oil exporting countries. Uh, and the one I focus on the most is Saudi Arabia. So I look at the, you know, these, these countries around the, the Persian Gulf. A lot of them are monarchies. Most of them are autocracies, at least. Um, and for them, climate change is really kind of a lose-lose proposition, right? So if you think about it, the first, you know, the, the, the first one of those propositions is what if climate action succeeds, right? So if, if climate action succeeds, they worry that their economies are going to tank, right? So if you, you know, Saudi Arabia, you know, and, and the other Gulf monarchies get about 80 to 90 percent of their government budgets from oil revenues. And they stay in power, these governments stay in power by basically distributing oil revenues as a form of patronage to basically buy public support, right? So, so if, the, if the world moves away from oil, then that political model falls apart. Um, but the other, you know, on the other hand of that lose-lose proposition, if climate action fails, then they're also in trouble, right? So, you know, if they succeed, they're in trouble with their economy. If it fails, they face warming temperatures that could render some of these countries, at least some of their coastal cities, uh, virtually uninhabitable, or actually, re in reality, uninhabitable uh, for parts of the year uh, during, like, you know, really high uh, temperatures in the summer. It's already really, really hot and humid in that part of the world. Um, so it's not, you know, this isn't something that's unique to oil exporting countries. It's unique to, you know, climate, you know, weather stressed countries already, um, uh, you know, especially around, you know, equatorial countries. But, um, you know, for these countries, uh, you know, uh, it, it, their own, their main industry is, is behind the threat, right? So it's, um, you know, it's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a double whammy. Um, so there's some research out that shows that um, some of the coastal cities in, in Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, uh, they could, you know, at, at high levels of current, uh, continued emissions, they could get uh, uh, so hot that healthy humans would actually die. You'd be killed uh, from prolonged exposure to that kind of heat um, sometime by the end of this current century, right? So within the conceivable ruling uh, spans of some of the current young crown princes that, that, that are, that are uh, uh, you know, on the cusp of taking power. So these countries basically face a major dilemma, okay? And it's different for them than it would be for oil producers in northern latitudes like Canada, Russia, or Norway. They don't face this same kind of lose-lose, dire choice dilemma. Uh, for them, climate damage is probably a longer term uh, a concern. Um, but so the obvious answer that, 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 that uh, they hear uh, and that they're looking at is to diversify their economies and reduce their reliance on oil. However, for them, there aren't any businesses that provide the consistently or persistently high returns that oil provides, right? So this is for various reasons. Oil just happens to be an extremely profitable business, especially for these guys, right? So Saudi Arabia, 
produces oil for about $8 a barrel, sells it for whatever the going price. I mean, that happens to be about $25 right now, but normally it's 50 to 60 to 70 or $80 a barrel, right? So, so in 2018, their returns were roughly 80% returns on investment. So these countries could move into, let's say, renewables, uh, but the returns would be a tiny fraction of that, right? They'd be about, you know, five to 10%. So can the Saudis or the Kuwaitis or the Emiratis finance their expensive monarchies on that kind of, uh, uh, those kind of returns? Well, probably not, uh, not in the same way that they're doing now. I mean, they could probably, these, these, these ruling families could probably stay in power, but they'd have to do so by either cranking up repression or opening up their societies to democratic participation. Um, you know, neither of those is, is, is something that they, these, uh, you know, the governments want to do. So right now they're looking at, you know, uh, sort of half measures, I guess you could say. They're trying to reduce, reduce the emissions from their oil businesses and then maybe offset some uh, additional re uh, 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 emissions by, you know, through carbon capture and storage or other ways of sequestering carbon. So let's just shift that to us here in Texas, where I am. I'm in Houston. Um, and so for us it here in Texas, it's kind of a similar story, okay? We've got, you know, we've had uh, uh, this fracking and shale uh, oil revolution and uh, oil and gas have again gotten to be a really big part of the Texas and Houston economy. About 10% of the direct, you know, uh, uh, the economy is based directly on oil, and about 30% indirectly, um, you know, in Houston, maybe a little bit less than that statewide. So climate change for for Houston is a similar lose-lose proposition, right? So you know, the economy depends on emissions-intensive industries, oil and gas, refining, petrochemicals, you know, liquefied natural gas exports, etc. So climate action would inflict pain on that part of the economy. You know, so does anything that reduces the oil price, uh, uh, you know, including right now the, the virus pandemic we're seeing, right? Um, and just like Saudi Arabia, Houston is on the front lines of climate damage, right? We've had, uh, you know, crazy amounts of rainfall and flooding and, and uh, you know, the, 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 the rising temperatures are driving up folks, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the electricity demand. So, so, uh, it's, you know, the, that similar dilemma here. Um, and I think like some of the rhetoric that you hear in Saudi Arabia and the International Climate Fora, Houstonians uh, feel a similar way. They feel that, um, you know, they would have to pay a disproportionate price uh, for a climate solution. So, so a lot of people here seem to think that it, the price for decarbonizing uh, uh, the earth and, uh, uh, you know, the atmosphere would be uh, worse than actually just putting up with climate change, right? So a lot of folks here are loath to talk about it uh, and they ignore it. Um, now that is starting to change um, and we're seeing some action here. There's a sort of some, some, some um, in it, initiative to, uh, for, for carbon capture and storage. Uh, there's some talk about carbon offsets uh, but it's just starting, uh, really. Um, so how do we proceed from here? I think, well, the, the lesson that I'm trying to get across here, I guess, is that oil is an extremely profitable business uh, and during most, you know, most time. You know, mo you know, it's not right now, I guess, but uh, uh, mainly it is. Um, and I think, you know, executives in, in the oil and gas industry are really unwilling to change their business models until something changes to make it less profitable or until some kind of policy forces their hands, right? So, um, so something that makes oil less attractive on a commercial basis, you know, like a carbon tax uh, perhaps, might help in a relative sense by making other energy businesses look more attractive, okay? So what you ideally need, I think, would be high prices for consumers to discourage consumption, at the same time as low prices for producers, okay? So you'd need, for something like that, it's, you know, you, you never have high prices, for, you know, you don't have this different prices in that way. You'd need a carbon tax or something like that to, to try and, and ac accomplish both those, those things. And if you, if you had something let, that really discouraged investment in oil, you'd probably see 
uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of movement into other uh, businesses. There's a lot of engineering expertise in, in Houston and Texas, and a lot of geology, geological expertise. Uh, those things are renew useful and, renew you know, some of the renewal renewables business, especially offshore wind or in carbon capture and storage, et cetera. So with the right st structure and the right incentives, I could see Houston and Texas uh, uh, diversifying uh, beyond oil probably more quickly than Saudi Arabia. So I guess I'll leave it there. Um, hope that's okay. Um, and and uh, again, sorry I was late and um, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Crane. That was wonderful. So the rest of the format of this event is we're going to open it up to questions. There's a Q&A box down below. Dr. Hayhoe has also already been answering a lot of questions. You can look under the answer tab. But I'm going to field some questions, and we're going to open up to the entire panel. Just, um, just let everybody talk. The first question I wanted to ask was directed to Dr. Crane. How does the recent decline in oil prices affect any thing like a carbon tax? How would it make it less effective? Um, is it still a reasonable proposal? And how long are things expected to be this low? You're muted, Dr. Crane. About <laughs> <Not> that? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, one way of looking at it right now is the perfect time to impose a carbon tax because fuel prices are extremely low, okay? Now, you would get absolutely no traction in Washington right now because, you know, the, the, the Republicans and Democrats are united in trying to uh, stimulate the economy, right? And they, they would, you know, uh, uh, imposing a tax now would be, um, you know, it just be a non-starter, right? You'd be laughed out of uh, Washington trying to do it now. However, um, with with oil and you know gasoline diesel prices so low right now i mean some some states they're, they're under a dollar um so what's going to happen if they stay that low well it, you know as as travel restrictions are lifted people are going to drive more they're going to buy more gasoline they're going to trade in their toyota prius for a you know a chevy suburban and you know they're gonna so you're going to get an even less efficient economy oil price uh, you know, falling oil price makes um, uh, oil and you know, gasoline more attractive. Uh, people consume more of it and emissions go up. So you'd like to have a carbon tax in place to prevent oil and, and gasoline from being, you know, getting so attractive that, um, that people start to, to, to get, you know, to, to get less efficient and start wasting it, et, et cetera. So, so probably now is, you know, is not the perfect time, but, um, you know, once, once folks start getting back to work and the economy starts recovering, it would be a great thing to, uh, to have on the, uh, at the ready. Can I, can I say one thing about that, James? Jump so for, yeah. my first thing is Doris, what would it, what would the impact be on your life if gas prices became went up? What does it mean for someone with a with a very low income to have gas prices go up? Like, what is how would that impact you? That would mean that I couldn't go as much as I would want to. Um, being on fixed income, you just don't have that privilege to just fill your tank up. You put a few dollars and go here and. You know, it's, it's it, it it would it would limit it would limit me significantly. What if gas prices were at the same level that they were before the COVID nineteen outbreak? So what if you what if they were around two dollars and fifty cents a gallon instead of about a dollar seventy five? Well, when it was two fifty, we went very little. I, I wasn't able to um, fill my tank up. But now I can, and really and truly, when it's when it's that high, people don't we don't have the money or the resources to continue doing what we would like to do. We can't have our meetings more. We can't, you know, we, we our our activity life is still limited with higher gas prices and with the diesel fuel and stuff. It. It, it smells up our neighborhood. Our breathing becomes kind of, my breathing becomes kind of constricted. 
The only so reason, the, the only reason why I asked Doris that, and I think is that I think that there's this idea, it's a totally prevalent idea that um, that we can solve these problems through market mechanisms. And a tax is a market mechanism. It's a way of playing with the market. And I just think we will probably need to use all the tools available. But I think it's really important to remember that when we use price, price as, a, as a mechanism, the way it impacts me and the way it impacts Doris are completely different. And so if we're going to have a just transition, we, we need to use prices as a way to change behavior in the short run but in the long run that means the wealthiest people are going to be able to pollute the most because they have the most money which at the at the beginning of the problem it is really the same people who got wealthy uh from burning the the fossil fuels that will then have the money to continue to burn fossil fuels so i know that's a little circular and we definitely do need to do things in the short term and prices might be that thing but I think like it's really important that we expand our imagination beyond the market as like a way of of tackling this problem. So, so there's a lot of people have expanded their imaginations to be beyond this, and and so if you look at carbon tax proposals that are uh, there's you know there's there's actually some that have been drawn up and 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 they're already on the on the books in in Congress where or at least you know it's proposed legislation. Uh, some of these are revenue neutral. Uh, a carbon tax is where, you know, so the government would raise, you know, right. incredible amounts of money, uh, depending on how high that tax would is. And then you'd have, since it's a regressive tax, as you point out, right, it impacts the poor more than it impacts the wealthy. Um, they would, uh, you know, some of the proposals out there are for uh, redistributing. Right. Either 100% of, uh, of, of, of the uh, the proceeds or at least some portion of the proceeds right to and it's and, and doing that on a means tested basis so to take as you correctly point out this re regressive tax and turning it into a more progressive policy right so mm -hmm. i didn't you know i didn't mention that when i i, I brought it up but you know you you, you got to do something with that revenue right so you know you can you can and it's a regressive tax as you so you, you'd want to do something uh, to, to, to adjust that and make it more progressive. Maybe build some wind, wind farms and solar arrays too. So that's another one of the proposals, right? So, so using that for, uh, you know, for, for, for zero carbon, uh, uh, you know, sources of energy, investing in, in that or for R and D. So there's a lot of proposals on, you know how to construct a carbon tax, and most folks don't even want to call it a carbon tax. I mean, actually, the you know the the founder of the Baker Institute, former Secretary of State James Baker, uh, is one of the proponents of this revenue neutral carbon tax. And I, I saw him. He, he we had Barack Obama coming to uh, to speaking at our twenty uh, fifth anniversary gala last year, and I, mm -hmm. I saw uh, Secretary Baker, and I said, "Oh, Secretary Baker, how's your carbon tax proposal going?" And he goes. Don't call it a carbon tax. It's it's a you know I forget what he calls it uh, you know uh, a, a a fee and dividend plan. So, um, but it's a you know for all intents and purposes it's a there, there's a tax involved. All right, I think we've run about the course on that question, um, Dr. Hayo. You've been answering. Plenty of questions in the comments right now. And I was wondering if there was any of those you'd like to spotlight and talk about. Sure. So, so just a reminder, if you have comments or questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I've disabled the chat now because we can't keep track of both. So please put them in the Q&A alone. Um, there were a couple of questions that I want to focus on and provide you with some resources as well. Just a second here and let me get this on my screen. Okay. Um, so a lot of people have been asking, um, could you share some of these resources with us? And well, I don't share my slides. What I do share is this recording. So this is going to be recorded and you can access it and share it. And we also have a series called Global Weirding. You can find it easily by just Googling it. It's on YouTube. It's called Global Weirding. It is done with our local PBS station here in West Texas in Lubbock. We have two special episodes on the coronavirus pandemic right at the top. And we also have an episode on Texas. The episode on Texas covers a lot of what I talked about in my talk. 
uh, just a second, if I Google Global Weirding Texas, it'll pop right up. Here it is. Texans don't care about, there we go. Texans don't care about climate change, right? That covers a lot of what I talked about. Um, and we also have episodes on renewable energy. So a couple of people brought up the questions of, well, aren't there a lot of downsides to renewable energy? So for example, wind turbines kill birds and bats, and solar energy requires expensive ingredients that you have to get from mining. And in some cases, manufacturing solar and wind turbines, of course, actually take uh, produce carbon emissions too. All of those are true to some extent because there is no free lunch. But what we have is a lunch that currently costs trillions of dollars. And by that, I mean the economic impacts of climate change driven by fossil fuels versus a lunch that costs a fraction of that. It is not free, but it costs a fraction of it. So for example, in terms of the carbon emissions or the greenhouse gas equivalent emissions associated with manufacturing solar or wind versus how much energy you get out of it, typically they break even after about six to eight months. So that's how long it takes before you're saving more greenhouse gases than you use to produce the power. And then in terms of birds, it turns out that while it makes absolute sense to not locate wind turbines in migratory bird pathways, the Audubon Society, and you can see the link in my answer to Yvette's question if you go to the Q&A, the Audubon Society specifically and explicitly endorses wind energy. Why would the Audubon Society do that? Because they know that fossil fuel use and climate change have orders of magnitude greater impacts on birds than wind turbines do. And in fact, if we're concerned about all birds in general, rather than just migratory birds, especially songbirds, it turns out the number one killer of songbirds is your outdoor kitty. Yes, we have a cat, he's very cute, but he doesn't go outside. Because if he goes outside, he's gonna be getting those birds and they are the number one cause of bird deaths in the US. So there is no free lunch, but there is an extremely expensive lunch and there is a much cheaper lunch and there's ways to make that lunch even cheaper. For example, with Elon Musk using renewable energy to generate the solar panels, as well as accurately siting the turbine farms here in Texas and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question I had is, climate change is oftentimes framed as a societal problem but we often look for individual actions we can take. I was wondering if any of y'all would like to speak on what we can do as individuals, but also things we should be pushing for from Texas in the near term future to make meaningful action. So I'll open that up to anybody. I'll take a first stab at it and then I would love okay. to hear Jim's perspective too. So we are often told that if everybody stopped eating meat or if everybody stopped flying or if everybody stopped having children, that that would fix climate change. Now, granted, if we all stopped having children, that would be the end of the human race. So in a way that would sort of fix it, but not in a way that most of us would find acceptable. Um, but the truth is this, when we look at who is responsible for the changes in climate so far, 90 corporations are responsible for two thirds of emissions since the dawn of the industrial era. And although the concept of a carbon footprint or an ecological footprint was created by people who care about the environment and ecology, it was popularized, the idea that we each have a carbon footprint, which we do, and the idea that we should be responsible for it, which we should, but it was popularized by a huge and expensive and well-funded ad campaign by British Petroleum in the 1980s. Why is that? It's because we absolutely need individual change. We eat much more meat than we need to. We don't think carefully about how we travel or where we fly. We're very inefficient and wasteful with our energy and our food. If food waste were its own country, it would be the number two, number three emitter after China and the US. So there are absolutely individual things we can do. And I do, I try to do two new things every year, myself personally. But I know that the single most important thing that I can do and that you can do is this, talk about it. 
talk about the risks, talk about the solutions that are good for Texas, and advocate for change at every level, in our family, at our school, at our church, at our business, at our city, at the state level, and even at the federal level. It is so important to advocate for change at every level from one individual up to the level of the world. Hard to argue with that. Um, but uh, so I guess from a Texas perspective, I think something that is really in play right now and that um, and actually where public comments are welcome right now is on uh, this debate of, about flaring of natural gas in Texas. So there's mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of oil and gas production. Uh, in the Permian Basin in West Texas and in the Eagleford Shale in South Texas uh, and elsewhere around the state as well. But, um, but there, uh, a, and a lot of the, the, uh, the companies that produce oil in those basins, their, the economics for their, uh, their business plan is based not around the natural gas, but it's based around getting the oil out and getting that to market. And so the, uh, the, the, the regulator, uh, the Texas Railroad Commission, which does not regulate railroads, but it regulates oil and gas, the Texas Railroad Commission has allowed these companies to basically flare as much gas as they want as long as they want to. Okay, so it, it, it has, um, since 2008, not denied a single uh, request for an extension or a permit uh, to flare off natural gas. That's basically burning the gas that you produce. So when you produce oil, it comes up, it's almost like a, like Coca-Cola, right? It's got bubbles in it and the bubbles, it's all, it's like, it's not carbonated, it's methane, methaneinated or whatever. So there's, there's a lot of methane in it that mixed in in bubbles and it comes to the surface. And normally, uh, you know, when you have a, a, you know, a, a responsible company that wants to capture and market that gas, you capture the gas and, and, and put it in a pipeline and send it to market where it's used for, you know, you burn it to make electricity or you, you make it, for, you know, petrochemicals out of it, et cetera. Um, but, in, but in Texas, it's, uh, it's viewed as a waste product because the, the price is so low. Companies don't want to, they want to get the oil out, and they, but they don't, they, don't, they don't care about the gas. They're, you know, they're, their economic model is based around oil. So state allows them to flare it. Um, but this on the on the 14th, the um, the Texas Railroad Commission is holding a hearing. Uh, then this subject is hopefully going to come up. Um, and so there's some talk about reducing production of oil in Texas, and the Environmental Defense Fund is um, hopefully going to get a chance to speak. And this is how they they are arguing that. Uh, and actually, we at the Baker Institute have been, have been saying the same thing um, that rather than just cutting production. Uh, uh, you know, sort of generally across the board, it's the companies that are flaring or even worse, venting uh, natural gas, just letting it vent to the atmosphere, uh, that they should be the ones that, uh, that cut production because, you know, there's a, as much gas being flared in Texas, uh, the amount of gas being flared in Texas would more than cover all the residential use in the entire state. It, it's about as much gas as used in, 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 in Austria or in Vietnam, okay? It's, 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 it's more than the gas used in the uh, in, in power generation in the state of Massachusetts, right? So it's a ton of gas being flared off. So That's a very shocking statistic that I had no idea about, Jim. So the amount of gas being flared in Texas would be enough to supply all the natural gas we use in the state. Is that right? Uh, residential demand. Residential demand. So like okay. for cooking and, and, and heating. And heating. Well, so uh, Richard has a question I think ties directly into that. He said, I heard they're flaring because they have too much, and instead of being able to sell it or provide free power, they just burn it off. Is that true? Uh, accurate representation? It is. So, I mean, it's to me, it's like, you know, you, know, mm -hmm. you, you should not be allowed to produce oil if you if you uh, aren't going to, you know, if, if, you, if you don't have a, a mechanism of available to take, you know, if you don't have takeaway capacity for the gas, right? You don't have a pipeline, you know, a, you know, a, a connection. So it would almost be like the equivalent would be, you'd be allowed to, to build a, a house or a neighborhood uh, without a sewer connection, right? I mean, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't allow a builder to, to, to do that. And, you know, I mean, it's it, so, so it's, and, and there are regulations on the books prohibiting this, they're just being ignored. So, so just enforcing regulations already on the books would go a long way. So I, I just, just related to both those things. Don't, uh, 
I think that one thing in terms of individual actions is that we need to start building political power because these are actually political questions. They aren't technical questions. Like Dr. Hayhoe can outline the technical solution to providing all the energy that we need. It's not actually a knowledge deficit and it's not actually a technical problem. The problem is a political and a social problem. And it's really about our values and our goals as a society. So where, where I think it's really important to say like, flaring the gas is completely irresponsible. And Dr. Crane's 100% right. I think if I was gonna say an, an individual action that you got, that people should be doing, it's really about how can you build political power? How can you build coalitions? How can you build movements? And how can you make sure that people that aren't normally included are included in those movements? So one thing is Doris actually just went to Washington to, to testify, to lobby uh, really Congress uh, members for, for flood mitigation infrastructure, right Doris? Oh, I think, yeah, there you go. You muted yourself. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we went to Washington to, to lobby Congress <clears throat> uh, about the uh, climate change. We are, it was three of us from Texas. Um, we went there and we talked about the, um, the golf course that they did. It was uh, Bio City Works and it was, it was me. So we had to um, see, get our Texas congressmen see how they felt about the climate change, see if they would be a part of it. And uh, most of them agreed and they were supposed to have been, you know, but then COVID came. So I don't know. I guess they put it on the back burner, but I continue to call and try to get in touch with them and see if they're still um, trying to do something about it. So I have not heard anything yet because we went for the uh, Wildlife Federation. So. I'm still on that. And then, you know, we still on the railroads about that and that methane gas and stuff, so. Yeah, Doris is also fighting the Union Pacific Railroad, which has left a massive creosote deposit in the Fifth Ward, which has the highest cancer rate of anywhere in the state. And I think that what's important about that story is that it's really a group of neighbors that were calling attention to this problem for years. And they were really dismissed. They were dismissed by lots of people. They were dismissed by Democrats and they were dismissed by Republicans. They were dismissed by the federal government and, and the company itself. But after an, building enough power and building enough alliances with other advocates, with environmentalists, with housing justice people, and just building that momentum, they finally are getting some attention to that problem. And I think it's going to have to be all of us doing that in our little ways on our little issues that are actually Global warming is kind of overwhelming because it's global, but the creosote deposit in your neighborhood or the flood that happens in your neighborhood or the smoke from the refinery in your city is something that you can tackle and really look at. And if we all solve those little problems, we'll be going a long way to solving the big problems. That's what, that's what I would say is you have to do politics if you want to do environment, unfortunately. And, and there again, your voice is your greatest weapon often. <laughs> totally, yeah. totally. Well, so there's actually a couple of questions about this that I would love to get people's opinions on. So Diane said, um, this is a question for Jim specifically. Um, so what is the opposition to a price on carbon that has bipartisan support? It has the support of the Climate Leadership Council, which was created by, you know, AT&T and Ford and ExxonMobil. All the big energy companies have at least on paper said they support carbon pricing. Nearly every economist in the world, including the two who won the Nobel Prize for economics a year and a half ago, say that that's the most effective way to reduce carbon emissions in a free market. And in my own home country of Canada, we had a price on carbon in four provinces for a few years, and those four provinces led the country in economic output before it became a federal policy. So Jim, if you could concisely summarize, what is the political opposition to a price on carbon? You know, as far as I can tell, well, there's First of all, the big loser in a, in a price on carbon would be coal, right? So the coal industry would be, I mean, they're all, you know, with cheap gas already running them out of business, um, a carbon tax would, would, would seal the deal, right? So the coal industry would be dead uh, in the U.S. Uh, in fairly short order, right? And so then it would make 
uh, you know, it, it, think about what a carbon tax would do. So it would make natural gas more expensive uh, and less competitive relative to uh, wind and solar and, and nuclear, right? So the you know zero carbon power uh, generation, um, and it would make um, uh, you know less efficient vehicles uh, less attractive to relative to more efficient ones, right? So uh, if you think about the, the the you know the levels of profit that you know Ford and GM make on their pickups and SUVs. Uh, pretty high level of profit, right? Those those are uh, expensive vehicles, and they, they you know that's really where their their profits come from. They don't make much on the smaller cars that are more efficient. So, so it, you know I think there'd be a lot of opposition from, um, you know, uh, uh, the fossil fuel interests, right? Now, if you talk to oil companies about their fa their 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 preferred you know, uh, a, a way of addressing climate, um, I think they, you know, they would prefer to see a carbon tax uh, over other, you know, capping trade or, you know, uh, 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 you know, stricter regulation. I think they'd, they'd like to see that so that, um, but, you know, I don't think they, they, they want a carbon tax, you know, because they, they think it's something that they, you know, they, they, they desire. I think it's just that it's, Compared with the other other ways of of uh, uh, you know mitigating carbon, uh, they see the tax as they're they're probably the least uh, uh, a tr you know troubling one. Um, and for oil, I don't think it, carbon tax probably wouldn't have a huge dent on oil. I mean, oil is a transportation fuel. The other two fossil fuels are more power generation fuels, and there's a lot of competition in power generation. Right? There's substitutes for coal, and all of them are cleaner. But there's also substitutes for natural gas, and some of them are cleaner. Right? For oil, there really isn't a substitute for oil. There, there, you know, there's electric vehicles on a small, you know, uh, on a, a tiny margin. Uh, so, and tr people are willing to pay a lot of money for transportation. You know, think about, you know, the, the cost of airline tickets, et cetera. So, uh, and the, you know, cost of a vehicle. So, to and if you go to Europe, if you, you know, the gasoline is, you know, don't, you know, close to ten dollars a gallon in some countries, right? So, uh, people are and they they still drive cars, right? So. Um, uh, so uh, transportation services are really valuable. And so uh, I think the oil companies are confident that a carbon tax wouldn't really hurt them that much. I don't know why this bill hasn't passed with all that said, right? It makes sense. It allows, you know, folks to, to find the, um, you know, most cost effective path to reducing their emissions, but why, uh, you know, why that's not good enough, uh, you, know, I mean, I, you know, I don't think the, the president wouldn't sign it. Um, and, you know, the way the politics is now, I think, you know, Republicans probably worry that someone would get voted out of office. They'd, they'd have a primary challenge from the right uh, and they'd get they'd get mm -hmm. shut down. So that's that's my guess. Well, there is a bipartisan climate solutions caucus, which we can post the link to here, um, where you're only allowed to join as a Democrat if you join with the Republicans. So it is 50 50. And the whole idea of that caucus is to give Republican legislators kind of a cover of having, you know, a couple of dozen fellow Republicans who are with them in promoting a bipartisan solution like this. Now, you raised a really good point, Jim, which relates to a question by Phil here. Phil asked about nuclear energy, and you raised the point that a price on carbon wouldn't only make wind and solar cheaper, it would also make nuclear cheaper. Now, Phil says, um, could nuclear energy be a better financial way to fix the problem? Well, um, the challenge, Phil, is this. First of all, um, it's primarily only for electricity, and electricity is just part of our, of our energy use. And the reason why we don't have any new nuclear these days, there hasn't been any new nuclear built in the US in decades. The only attempt to do so in the Southeast US was actually just, they pulled the plug on it a few years ago. There's one reason, cost. Nuclear energy is currently, conventional nuclear energy is currently the most expensive way to generate electricity. But here's the thing, there absolutely is innovation happening there and a price on carbon could help spur innovation, like what? Well, there's this thing called micronuclear that they developed at Idaho National Labs, and they're rolling it out with a company called New Scale, NU Scale, in Oregon, to see if modular mini nuclear could be more affordable, more flexible, and more safe. And in fact, a headline I just read was kind of funny, Rolls-Royce. That's, yeah, that's the car company in the UK. Rolls-Royce is actually planning to build 15 mini modular nuclear plants in the UK because the UK has really stringent carbon goals and so they're more financially incentivized to support clean energy. Um, what I wanna do though is I wanna emphasize this, when it comes to climate change, there is no silver bullet. There's no one thing that will fix 
everything. But what we do have is we have a plethora of solutions. And one of the best resources on that, I'm showing with my screen right here, it's called Project Drawdown. You can find it online at drawdown.org. I'll add the link there to the chat box. And they go through all of the different solutions, some of which are ones that you would think of already, like um, solar energy and wind energy. But some of them are things that you might not have thought of, like bamboo production to take up carbon from the atmosphere and composting. Right. And if you go all the way down to N, there's nuclear power right there between net zero buildings and nutrient management. So there are a plethora of really positive constructive solutions. And um, talking about that portfolio, I think, is really important because it will empower different people to act in different ways. So I want to turn to a different question here and pose this to Ms. Doris and to Ben. Um, and that is a question about here in Texas, um, how do we, and this is Larry's question, how do we raise the level of constructive bipartisan discussions? You guys have had a lot of discussions, it sounds like. So what is your secret to having constructive bipartisan discussions in Texas? Oh, Doris, you want to go first? <laughs> we go out through the communities and we, we get opinions. We let everybody... <clears throat> Our groups, we um, we use that model of, you know, what well, we don't have a leader. Everyone does input. We get it, we get together and we discuss it and we, we take it, you know, we use the same model in all our groups. We all get together, we discuss it. We, we have built Facebook pages, we did Instagram. So we let the public know what we're about we try to, uh, we, we get more members like that. And we have people that join us on this. So we just, we discuss it. And then we, we, we form a plan and we implement that plan. You want yeah, to take it from there? Yeah, sure. So um, I would say two things. One is what Doris is saying about um, trying to understand that everyone, many people have, have really good ideas and understandings of their own life, especially, and that we always try to start with people's lived experience and people's material reality. Because there's a lot of agreement on a question like, isn't it terrible to live in a neighborhood that floods? Like, no one is going to disagree with you on that. It's a material reality. And and, and what that does when you let people do that is you build trust, right? Because you're validating someone's perspective and someone's experience and that that creates space for openings. But what I would say also in terms of the idea of bipartisanship is that our, our politics, which are definitely ruled by partisanship at this moment, are also sort of restrictive in this way where certain types of criticism are off limits and certain types of cooperation are off limits, which is why this having a Republican and a Democrat join at the same idea is acceptable, right? But I also think when we have a question about bipartisanship, we have to take questions of white supremacy, of homophobia, of xenophobia and racism really seriously. And I think there is a question when you're trying to build you know, a movement for a better world is like, who actually is at a point where they are ready to be part of that coalition, right? Like if, you're, if your belief about the world is that you have to oppress other people in order to be powerful, then you're not ready for the step into the next world, into the better world that we know we need. So, so whereas we are very motivated by environmental issues, I think that we have a much broader conversation that actually I think opens the door to a lot of people who wouldn't consider themselves Democrats or Republicans, which is maybe 50% of America is like pretty checked out of the political process. So we think a lot it's about engaging those people and meeting their material, starting with the material, starting with like, what is your house like? What's your neighborhood like? And building out from there. And that, that's the really the path to cooperation. So we hope we're right. Well, that, that actually feeds directly into a couple of questions. I'm not going to read them all, but they all relate directly to this type of issue, which is what about the issue of what we call um, a just transition? 
So in other words, the fact that we do have a lot of jobs in the oil and gas industry here in Texas, there's a ton of them in Houston. And just as the world no longer uses horses and buggies, in 50 years, the world is not going to be relying primarily on burning fossil fuels for its energy. But how are we going to ensure not that the the fat cat executives with the seven figure salaries, but how do we ensure that the average person with a, you know, a GED degree who's working out in, in you know, West Texas on, on the Permian Basin oil fields, or somebody who, you know, it's just, you know, they have an office job or they're an engineer and they work in the oil industry. How do we ensure that there is a transition for them? So the fact that we are trying to wean ourselves off fossil fuels doesn't mean suffering for others. Um, I would love to hear everybody's perspective because I feel like Jim has kind of a macro perspective on this and you, Ben and Doris, you have a really micro perspective. And let me just share my own personal story first. Um, so a year ago last Christmas, uh, I mentioned how every year I like to do two new things. So, um, you know, whether it's uh, getting rid of the freezer and reducing food waste or whether it's getting a plug-in car. Um, but a year and a half ago, I had already done my two things that year. And then just before Christmas, um, I got one of those dreaded emails that says your credit report has been pulled. And I was like, oh no, somebody's like identity theft or something's going on. So I said to my husband, I think there's a horrible problem. We have to lock down our accounts. Somebody's checking out my credit record. And he said, oh no, don't worry about it. I said, what do you mean don't worry about it? He's like, I know about it. I said, what, what do you mean you know about it? He's like, well, I can't tell you. I said, why can't you tell me? He's like, well, well, it turned out that for Christmas, he had done all the research and he had figured out that we needed solar panels. But not only that, he found a company in San Antonio, Texas that manufactures the solar panels called Mission Solar. And when oil prices last fell, not this time, but the time before, and when all of the guys working in the oil fields out in West Texas lost their jobs, Mission Solar in San Antonio took in a bunch of them and retrained them to do solar panel manufacturing, which is a permanent job right here in Texas. And that's who we got our solar panels from. So I love that in that small way, we were able to contribute to that just transition. But bigger picture, why don't we start off with you, Jim? Bigger picture, how do we consider transitioning the state's economy? Well, uh, hmm, I'm not sure I have a, the answer for this one, but um, I did look a little bit into salaries, comparing salaries in the oil business with those from renewable business. And again, it's like, it's just a less attractive from a salary standpoint, right? I mean, you know, the oil industry has, you know, with those, these returns that, that, that they make, they, they have, they have cash available for lobbying and for, you know, for sponsoring research and, and for uh, lots of other spending and large salaries to attract talented engineers and, and executives. Right. So, so the, um, it, 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 the renewables is just a much, much more competitive industry and in that, you know, competition tends to drive down returns. I mean, that's what it's making. That's what's it's helping to compete uh, with fossil fuels and by making it cheaper, ever cheaper. And the people that take those jobs that are on, the, on those lower salaries are, are one of the key reasons that, that, you know, you've got solar and wind now competing with gas uh, pretty handily. But um if you are a as somebody who's used to, uh, you know, $120,000 salary, um, you know, you, you know, it, what you're going to get in the, you know, in the wind or solar industry is going to be more like 50 or 60 or, you know, $70,000. Right. So it's not like that for everybody. I mean, folks, you know, that, that sell those systems. If you're a person that's in sales and you're, you know, you're selling big wind farms, doing big deals, uh, you, you know, you can make a lot more than that, but but you don't see the same kind of largesse, you know, from, from wind companies in, in, in lobbying or in sponsoring research or, um, you know, some of the other things that they, you know, a, a, you know bankrolling a, a candidates or, you know, they don't put forward their own candidate for the Texas Railroad Commission, et cetera. So it's, um, uh, you know, again, I mean, it's, 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 it's tough to, um, to, 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 find, you know, to compete with, with the oil business. Now, if the oil business becomes less profitable, then again, that, 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 that makes the other ones look more competitive on a, in a relative basis. And when folks who are actually working in the fields, I mean, those jobs are typically um, kind of temporary, almost like gig economy jobs. You hear about them driving for Uber in their downtime. I mean, I've, you know, I've gotten picked up by Uber drivers who work in, in West Texas. Uh, or they go deal blackjack in Las Vegas, or you know they go to 
you know, ski, they, you know, they, they work in a ski resort or, you know, they, they take those kind of typically those, those types of jobs. I, I would mention though that um, for the last five years, according to the National Bureau of Labor Statistics, the number one fastest growing job in the whole country for the last five years has been either wind energy technician or solar energy technician. And while the pay might not be as good as, as the six figures that you get with a GED degree working out in the oil fields in the Permian Basin, it's stable. You're not going to be fired or let go. It's better living conditions. Um, there absolutely are trade-offs. Okay. Um, ben and Doris, just transition. Tell us your thoughts. Yeah, Doris, why don't you start? Like when you think of a world after fossil fuels and like a, a you know, a peaceful and prosperous world, like what does that look like to you? <laughs> it looked like cleaner air. I'd be able to walk out and see stars. My grass would be greener. The kids that come, they wouldn't have suffer with asthma and everything. Everybody would be driving a Prius or an electric car. And maybe, just maybe, it would trickle down to our neighborhoods. We would have, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be a cloud hanging over us. We wouldn't be, we would be able to have some of the things that everyone else have. We'd have retention ponds to stop the flooding. Someone would come and clean our drains on a regular basis. Our input would be valued instead of just wash the side, you know, so. And I, I think that Doris brings up a, a really good point about the just transition, which is a fossil free world will be more just. Fossil fuel production involves like across the world involves a lot of repression and oppression like in Saudi Arabia and it also uh, a lot of um, instability in terms of booms and busts which are generally not very good for marginalized people um, and I think that there is some justice in just doing the transition but I also think Doris brought up some important things like retention ponds and someone cleaning her drains and I also want to say that there are 17,000 people in Houston who've applied for the city's home repair program and only 53 have received any sort of assistance after two and a half years. There's a lot of work to be done in our society, which is not being done. There are elderly people in their houses isolated. There are children without food. And my point being, not that somehow going away from oil will solve all those things, but that if the question is, what are all these people going to do for jobs? Well, there's one great example would be like, how about repairing homes of people who are living in mold? And if the question is, well, how is that going to be paid for? I think we've seen in the last three weeks that when there is political will, you can pay for just about anything. Mm -hmm. Really, the money exists. You know, we are in a situation right now where there's a global pandemic and the richest person in the world is starting a GoFundMe to pay for his employees' sick time. And that's because the political will to demand that money back, uh, it doesn't exist. And I learned this week that FDR during World War II created a 95% tax on any capital gains over 8%. Okay, so this is the guy considered the greatest president of all time by, by many people, or, you know, very good president. I know there are some conservatives that think the New Deal is some distortion of democracy or something. But all I'm saying is this is actually in our political past to do things like this, and it can easily be in our political future, and that there's so much work to do. So if the question is, what are these jobs going to be doing? And another thing is, if we go away from fossil fuels, some jobs will actually require more labor. And that is not a bad thing. We have structural unemployment. So having, having community gardeners, having someone on your block whose job it is to produce some food for poor people that live in your neighborhood for free, that's a great, that's a great thing that would be part of a just transition. And I think that what's hard is to imagine a better world. And I, I, for lots of reasons, we all have to go about our life and navigate the world that exists. So we don't get a lot of time to do that. But um, I think there's a lot of work to be done that has nothing to do with energy production. I think a lot of it has to do with care and that is connected to sort of structural sexism in that care work is considered non-economic work that women are supposed to do at home. Um, and there's all this 
there are all these ways in which oil production and other types of oppression are, are connected. And so I just think that uh, there's a lot of work we could do in a just transition to get to the world Doris imagines of like having a livable, nice neighborhood. And that actually ties directly into a question I think Stuart has asked a couple of times, which is what are the co-benefits? So this is really important because 20 years ago, there was a paper published by a scientist called Luis de Fuentes who calculated that according to the health costs and the economic costs of burning coal, because coal is the most inefficient and dirty way of getting energy we have, according to those costs back 20 years ago, there was no reason to be using coal at all, none. So why are we still using it today? It's because those reaping the benefits are not those who are paying the price. There is a profound disparity. Around the world, nine million people die from air pollution every year, nine million. In the United States, 200,000 die from air pollution related illnesses every year. That is orders of magnitude more than the coronavirus pandemic. It is not to discount the devastating impacts of the pandemic in any way, shape, or form, but it is to say that somehow we have become blasé or callous to the fact that we are paying 200,000 lives every year for our fossil fuel use. And when you look around the world, the countries who are suffering the greatest impacts from a changing climate in terms of drought, insecurity, flooding, and more, those countries are the ones that have contributed the very least to this problem. So the benefits of reducing climate change are manifold. In fact, for the United States in the National Climate Assessment, we calculated that based on the economic impacts in only a very limited number of sectors, just a few of them, not the whole economy, but based on only the economic impacts in a few sectors versus the cost of the U.S. as a whole meeting its Paris Agreement, tar agreement targets, we would break even in about 10 years, economically speaking, let alone the fact that we would be reducing much of the pollution that if you include air and water and soil together, causes one sixth of all deaths around the world. So the co-benefits are enormous. And I think this relates directly, um, it feeds directly into a question that Jim got from Larry, and this is probably the last live question that we'll take. Um, what about the co-benefits of financial investment? We've actually seen a, a lot of big investment firms like BlackRock announcing that they were going to divest from, BlackRock's divesting from coal, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is divesting from new oil and gas exploration, this country of Ireland is divesting from fossil fuels, uh, Microsoft has announced that it's going to be not only carbon neutral but carbon negative by drawing carbon out of the atmosphere. So Jim, if you could take Larry's question, um, what do you think are the financial benefits of fossil fuel divestment? Uh, gosh, I don't know. I, you know, I may have to just come at it from a, I don't know if there's financial benefits from divestment. I mean, uh, uh, you know, just saw the, you know, oil company stocks have been getting hammered, of oh, gosh, for the past 10 years and they're, um, and they're, they've been beaten way down. So it, it hasn't, it's been pretty apparent that it's, it's a bad sector to, uh, to invest in until like yesterday when they took a huge jump. Right. So, um, uh, but I think longer term, there's a, uh, you know, if, if folks that are investing for a long, uh, for the long term and they, they um, especially funds like, you know, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, for example, you know, the Norwegian economy is already based on fossil fuels. If you're already exposed to climate risk in your national economy or if your business line is already heavily exposed to that, you don't want to be overexposed to it, especially now. Um, and, it's, and some of the if uh, you know fossil fuel sectors are more exposed than others right again oil does not have a viable substitute yet at this point but in, you know in transportation so oil is probably less so um but there are uh, you know a lot of divestment campaigns there are um uh there's also the entire insurance sector that is a very uh you know it's kind of on the other side of the climate argument from the um from um you know the energy sector in in, in that um they aren't, you know, they, they, they have a financial stake in seeing that, um, you know, the climate action does proceed because their payouts are getting bigger and bigger because for all the severe weather events that, 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 um, that you know, they have to pay out. So, so they've been div divesting 
uh, and they've been divesting from fossil fuels, you know, uh, especially. Uh, and there's all, you know, the, sh the shareholder activism that, um, you know, folks don't want to, you know, balance their retirement on the backs of future generations, right? So there's sort of the ethical uh, side of that. You know, I don't like to talk so much about the financial side. I'm not an investment in, in advisor. Um, I mean, I, I know that there, you know, there's, there, there's definitely long-term risks to your company. If your company's business model has governments, individuals, and companies, you know, uh, uh, actively seeking to overturn it and f find a substitute for it as fast as, as they can, um, you know, at some point you're probably going to face some risks, but, you know, how, how you know, when those ris risks are, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, materialize, I don't know. There's, there's one other question on here I wanted to answer real quick. Mm -hmm. for for handing it over here do it um, quick so we can have our last statements oh sorry brandy um the citizens climate lobby uh might be uh what you're looking for uh, you said you're looking for something um where you can um you know you for a, a bigger platform for for your voice uh to to, to email legislators and congress etc so that might be a good one for you sorry yes. yeah. Oh, that's great. I'll put the link in there. Okay. So thank you everybody from joining. You guys have been fantastic. We had dozens of questions. We had well over a hundred people on at various times. This is going to be recorded and shared, but I want to give everybody the chance. If you could just kind of, you know, one sentence or two sentences at most, what would you like to leave people with? What thought would you like to leave people with? And I would like, if you don't mind putting on the spot, James, I would like you to start because you are the organizer of this entire event. So if you had people leave with one thought, what would it be? Well, I wasn't expecting to be put on the spot here, but um, I don't know. I, I really hadn't thought of anything. I think I would want to echo Dr. Hayhoe's point. I think this is, this is a meaningful issue, both down the road and immediately, but it's, nothing's going to get done unless everybody agrees and is on the same page that this is something that is a problem. I think we saw with the coronavirus pandemic a little bit, how long it took for people to acknowledge the problem, how long it took for meaningful action to really get taken. So I think that really stresses the fact that as much as a lot of environmental academics and activists love to talk about this stuff amongst ourselves, nothing really gets done unless you share what we talked about today with somebody who probably doesn't care about climate change. That is a great bottom line. Um, all right, um, Ben, Doris, and then Jim. What, if you could leave people with one thought, what would it be, Ben? Um, my one thought would be to beware of Star Trek. And what I mean by that is that it's very easy for us to imagine that there's a technical or technological solution to these problems. And I think that we're soaked in a world where the innovation, we have a cult of the innovator, of the disruptor, and that what we really need is a sustained political movement uh, for a more just society where we care about the environment. And we're going to all have to do what James said, which is we're going to have you know, we say organize or die, basically, like we're gonna have to start building those links between people who are slightly different from us and let them link to people slightly different from them and on and on. So we build a group of people that can counter the power of the oil sector, because that's what we're going to need to do, because they aren't going to design their own downfall. Excellent point. Doris, what would you like to leave people with? I would, I would say get involved. Find out who your representatives are, start lobbying them, and just be that noise that, you know, they said the noise uh, uh, will get the grease. You got to make some noise. You got to get people involved that's going to make some noise to the people, to the politicians. Like we do. You just, you just got to go out there. I love that. All right, Jim. What thought would you leave people with? Well, I, I would I would echo what Doris just said, really. You know, squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Um, you know, so the one thing I guess that, well, at least since I was on, <laughs> um, we didn't really talk about is that 
the big unknown is government policy, right? So government policy is what you need to move the needle. It's not going to happen quickly enough through, uh, uh, you know, shareholder pressure or, you know, divestment or whatever. So, uh, and government policy, you know, it's, it's really hard to model. So none of the, none of the sort of the, the, the you know, the models out there about, um, you know, how long oil is going to uh, continue to grow before it peaks, oil demand and, 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 and turns down. Not that, that government policy can't really be effectively fa factored into those models because it's not known. So, and government policy depends on, um, you know, who we vote for and uh, who we call and who we email and, and uh, uh, mm. so getting involved in that. So that, that and, you know, because that's, that's the, their, their job is to basically represent their constituents. So, um, so I'd say try and um, push government at all levels to, um, uh, to take it seriously. Absolutely. I think you're kind of hearing the same message from all of us. I love the metaphor of the squeaky wheel. Be the squeaky wheel. And if you ever think that one person couldn't change the world, you never realize that one person bought a pangolin at a Chinese market and they changed the world in a bad way. But you know what? We can change the world for good. Just let me leave you with this image. Yes, we can take individual actions to reduce our personal carbon footprint. And I know a girl who did that. She convinced her entire family to stop eating meat, to stop flying. But nobody would know who she was if she hadn't done one more thing. She used her voice. She took a piece of cardboard, she painted a sign on it, she went and sat outside a building a little bit over two years ago. And today, because she used her voice, everybody knows her name and her name is Greta. So the most powerful thing we can do is use our voice to advocate for change. Please join us in doing that in Texas. Thank you. Thank you guys. Before we leave, yes, before we leave, I just wanna say huge thank you to all these panelists. Y'all have been absolutely incredible. We went a little over time, but probably had some really great conversation. Especially Dr. Hayhoe, you really filled with that conversation for a while and that was wonderful. And then finally, thank you to everyone else who joined us. Um, we had a lot of y'all on here and we couldn't know without y'all. So this webinar will be available at solveclimate2030.com in the coming days if you wanna share it. But that's all we have, so thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys, appreciate y'all. Right. Thanks.